and uh, we'll be going over a couple of uh, housekeeping matters for uh, this webinar session this morning. And then uh, I'll turn things over to Professor Advincula. So first off, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. My name is Gerald Pasquale. I'm with the technical marketing team here at Park Systems. We're a leading manufacturer of atomic force microscopy and other emerging nano microscopy uh, solutions uh, based in the Santa Clara, California office. And today we have a very special webinar series getting its premier session off the ground. 3D printing viscous solutions is the topic. And we are here with Professor Rigoberto Advincula of Petrocase and the Department of Macromolecular Science and Engineering at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. Um, today, like I mentioned, uh, this is gonna be a webinar premiere, webinar series premiere on a series of 3D printing topics, um, on topics ranging from, as you see here, viscous solutions, to coatings and methodologies, to looking at plastics and the circular economy, to looking at polyurethane polymers, uh, to cellulose and pecta nanocomposites by SLA. Um, this is going to be the first of several uh, webinars that are going to be tied together under the umbrella of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. So please keep an eye out on parkafm.com and in your email inboxes for um, the, uh, the full listing <clears throat> of uh, webinars from Professor Advincula this year on this, uh, again, umbrella topic. And uh, this will be what we focus on for 2018. Uh, thank you very much for signing in. This uh, webinar uh, has your microphones muted, and that's by design. Uh, we will be handling questions and answers at the end of the professor's talk today. But we highly encourage you guys to go ahead and send us questions using the questions module in your GoToWebinar control panel. Send them in at any time, fire at will. And what we'll do is we'll answer them sequentially at the end of the talk. We'll have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the slides here. So uh, without further ado, let me go ahead and turn things over to our esteemed speaker, Professor Advincula. Professor, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Gerald, for, uh, again, for this uh, opportunity to give a webinar to our uh, audience, our dedicated audience. Um, uh, today, as you mentioned, is the start of a series on 3D printing, uh, where we will have uh, uh, overview and tutorial of various topics uh, related to 3D printing and materials research. So I hope uh, the, our audience finds this series useful uh, uh, with respect to satisfying their curiosity about the uh, uh, 3D printing ecosystem as well as materials research. So uh, I'd like to start, of course, by introducing myself. Uh, I'm a professor here at Case Western Reserve University, uh, Department of Macro Molecular Science Engineering. Uh, we are located in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, within the university, we have a uh, um, institute called Thinkbox, which is uh, uh, an opportunity really for uh, students, faculty, and uh, our uh, partners, visitors to be engaged in the additive manufacturing rapid prototyping process. And uh, it's located in a um, facility on campus where we have access to a number of major uh, 3D printing systems um, and in partnership with, uh, for example, strategies and 3D systems, as well as uh, several uh, materials companies that work with us, uh, my group in particular, to explore uh, new types of 3D printed materials. Uh, now, as a professor, I have focused a lot on uh, uh, macromolecular science, or polymers for short, uh, interfaces, different type of nanostructure materials, but we work with a number of companies on various projects related to coatings, different types of nanostructured systems, emulsions, uh, and uh, various types or methodologies of fabrication. 
uh, we eventually want to relate to industry through translational research where we want to work with uh, solving efficiencies and uh, finding the best performance cost ratio in a number of commercial applications. And in fact, uh, I uh, am the director of PetroCase, uh, a uh, center uh, that is dedicated to introducing new materials for the challenging fields of energy extraction, uh, resource uh, utilization, and oil field chemicals. I'm also a member of CLIPS, which we do a lot of uh, uh, investigation on processing issues related to plastics, melt flow indexing, uh, different types of packaging, and again, uh, polymer materials useful for uh, commercial applications. So today, I'm going to focus on 3D printing. And uh, this was my opening slide uh, that I gave a talk in Dubai at the World Economic Forum uh, almost two years ago, uh, where I, I talked about the different opportunities, challenges, uh, ecosystems, commercial applications of uh, 3D printing. Where you are interested in using 3D printing as a hobby, as a means for rapid prototyping or production, uh, definitely one can say that the price is going down as far as cost of the printer itself and access to materials. Unfortunately, uh, one cannot see 3D printing yet as a type of high throughput production uh, in many ty types of uh, uh, solutions or products uh, comparable yet to uh, things like uh, injection molding, uh, fiber fabrication, blown film molding, etc. Yeah, 3D printing holds a place of its own in, in many respects and uh, um, is growing. One thing I like about 3D printing is the ability to take nature and be inspired by developing new types of materials and design, adapting the best that has been perfected uh, in nature or looking at controlling resolution all the way to the micro or even nano level. Uh, again, very challenging, not only in terms of the uh, instrumentation involved, the uh, chemistry is very important. And a lot of this is accessible essentially by two photon polymerization. Yet a growing field and a commercial space right now is biomedical application. Uh, 3D printing uh, is growing leaps and bounds in the dental industry. Well, as you can see here, there's a lot of potential for prosthesis devices, support, uh, scaffolding for uh, tissue engineering and bone replacement. On the other hand, its impact on uh, uh, needs for the automotive industry and aerospace application uh, is growing. And in fact, uh, although I'm going to talk to you more about polymer materials today, uh, 3D printing of metals and even other non-metals such as ceramics uh, is quite important and growing. In the area of light weighting, light weighting and uh, uh, rapid parts replacement, uh, that's important not only for the uh, aircraft industry but also for the military. And then, of course, uh, building construction or the use of additive manufacturing uh, to build uh, machines, but also to fabricate structures uh, that uh, can go beyond um, uh, other automation methods. And of course, uh, uh, simplicity as well as uniformity in fabrication methods, all the way to space, perhaps. So as you can see here, uh, 3D printing holds its own when it comes to uh, complexity, uh, limited production of high performance parts. Uh, essentially, uh, the high performance as well as complexity are things that can be quite, quite unique with 3D printing. On the other hand, a 3D printing cannot compete with traditional methods such as casting, cutting, or uh, subtractive manufacturing, or even uh, high throughput methods such as injection molding, molding, or thermoforming. So there is a real gap between additive manufacturing and the current manufacturing throughput requirements. 
uh, of course, there are many choices uh, when it comes to 3D printing. And I'm not uh, even touching today uh, uh, techniques like FDM or FFF, uh, which uses a filament of plastic and is probably the most common type of 3D printing printing uh, technique will encounter. Uh, and then we have multi-jet, SLA, stereolithographic apparatus method, or uh, um, uses of uh, uh, photochemistry or photopolymerization. Uh, some are familiar with the clip process. Uh, another is, of course, the use of powders for selective laser sintering. So I can name about uh, 10 different, uh, 10 other types of 3D printing, but uh, obviously we will not have time to cover that. So uh, our today's theme is on viscoelastic materials or viscose solution printing, or sometimes called phase extrusion printing. So let me start by reviewing uh, the uh, mechanical response of solid state materials or materials in general. Uh, we can classify this as a extensional uh, response uh, or extensional application, of course, that could be in the form of uh, flexural or uh, very much classical hooks though. On the other hand, uh, the application of force uh, to a direction uh, where deformation occurs in, in one uh, surface, for example, uh, is a application of Hooke's law, but requires a, a um, clear relationship between uh, shear stress and the corresponding strain. So the application of shear results, results in deformation over the original length, okay, which is defined by uh, the tangential uh, phi or alpha. Here is probably a uh, a more um, elaborate uh, deformation response uh, uh, with materials where you can have a, essentially two types of forces, an elastic force and a viscous force, or the combination of both is a viscous force. A elastic force um, is essentially a step uh, strain or a stress versus time relationship. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the proportionality of an elastic solid is uh, on and off. As you can see here, if you remove the strain, you reduce the stress. On the other hand, a viscous fluid has a force or stress proportional to the strain rate. And this is really where you experience or observe the differentiation between viscous materials. So there's a fast deformation with a solid-like behavior or a slow deformation with a fluid-like behavior. The combination of a viscoelastic material means that you have both a viscous and elastic response. And you, of course, measure this uh, with a, uh, a viscometer or rheometer. And uh, very often, viscoelastic materials results in a um, uh, permanent deformation uh, that is hard to restore, unlike an elastic force uh, which goes back to this original position. So again, a further review, you can see here uh, the difference between an elastic response, a pure elastic response, and a viscoelastic response. So the shear stress uh, can uh, be defined by the change in uh, the or deformation over the original length or area. A shear strain is the response uh, for the stress. And here we go to a very common term, which is called modulus. Modulus is defined essentially as the stress over strain relationship. On the other hand, viscosity is a shear stress divided by the shear rate. So there's a time element when it comes to uh, viscosity. And this type of uh, force or application can be both affine or non-affine. Uh, affine means you have a local strain, a microscopic strain resulting in uniform uh, deformation. On the other hand, a non-affine response 
uh, will result in, uh, let's say, as you can see in this figure, a rheological response. Now, I introduced the term rheology there, which I will also try to limit because this is not a uh, discussion of rheology, meaning you have a relationship on this non-affine uh, deformation that is related to frequency and time. And this applies to materials like biopolymers, microgels, emulsions, suspensions, and paste. And of course, today's topic is viscoelastic material. So unfortunately, uh, uh, I will try to uh, reduce the um, discussion on rheology for the interest of time, uh, viscometry, or investigation of uh, uh, viscous uh, properties. But we can uh, pick that up may perhaps in another uh, dedicated talk on rheology. But suffice it to say, uh, we can classify a viscosity response either as Newtonian or non-Newtonian. A Newtonian would have a uh, constant viscosity with increasing shear rate, a, a shear thickening uh, material will have an increase in viscosity, a nonlinear increase in viscosity over increase in shear stress, and the shear thinning will be a uh, uh, decrease in viscosity with increase in shear stress. Now, a um, related response to Newtonian is Bingham plastic or Bingham uh, response in which you need to maintain or you need to reach a critical um, viscosity uh, before you observe a Newtonian behavior. In other words, a, it's a Newtonian plus a constant behavior. Another uh, plot that I'd like to show you, since a lot of the things that we deal with with 3D printing is polymers, is that polymers in general, uh, and one can relate this to the molecular structure, the molecular weight, the uh, degree of polymerization, and eventually their viscoelastic response uh, as a function of those structure property relationship uh, has a time temperature dependence. In other words, uh, polymers age, polymers creep, but then that knowledge in terms of their shear rate and time scale dependence is very important for processing, including 3D printing. And much paper has been, uh, much uh, studies have been done on processes involving injection molding, extrusion. And interestingly, uh, this is a hot topic or a favorable topic to further investigate with the various 3D printing methods uh, that utilizes polymer materials. And, and that is really where uh, we try to focus our research, trying to develop structure property relationship with viscous materials, polymer materials with new 3D printing methods. So what is viscous solution printing? Well, let's start with this uh, um, images here. Essentially, what some people call ink or paste is a viscous material that in most cases needs to be thixotropic, okay? Uh, so my uh, definition of thixotropic for you, the simplest is that it has to cure fast or it has to solidify as you print it. In other words, as, as you deposit the material during the printing process, it needs to build up strength in order to hold the additional materials that will be added to it as the printing progresses. Ideally, uh, this type of thixotropic behavior uh, is viable in room temperature, or you may have to apply vacuum or, or cooling in order to uh, observe a more favorable thixotropic behavior. Uh, in some cases, uh, post-curing, uh, oven heating, or even photochemical conversion uh, is needed in order to finish the fabrication method. And thus, this technique, uh, which we just call VSP or viscous solution printing, can be applied towards the printing of polymers, adhesive materials, clay, chocolate, food, ink, and therefore a good knowledge of viscosity control 
the design parameters, even the slicing uh, um, design or the uh, STL file has to be related with the viscous properties of the material. Now, a key element uh, in viscous solution printing actually is the use of a proper printing head. Now, FDM actually is a viscous solution printer. It's just a hot melt viscous solution printer that extrudes a polymer. Uh, and as the polymer comes out of the printing head in FDM, it solidifies or quenches and, and thus forming a um, solid object material after the printing process. In a viscous solution printing, you don't need heat uh, in most cases. All you need is a good way to um, devolve or extrude the material from a refined tip, uh, let's say with a CNC movement that gives you uh, the defined structure. And usually this involves a continuous deposition. In other words, uh, uh, in order to come up with an object or design, uh, the flow rate and the stop flow behavior has to be uh, very well controlled. So uh, designs that can involve mixing prior to extrusion or heating uh, prior to extrusion or the development of very precise step motors are very important for viscous solution printing. On the other hand, the simplest viscous solution printing you can guess is a syringe. A syringe type printing means that you need to have a pressure, an internal pressure that is applied towards the delivery of the ink material, let's say to a directly from a syringe or through a tube that eventually synchronizes with the movement of the head. A pressure is applied, uh, could be that of a syringe, uh, type of pressure or controlled syringe movement, such as some some of the things that they use in microfluidics or uh, uh, biological experiments, can be applied towards 3D printing. Uh, what you see here is essentially a layer by layer deposition of the viscous material, a thixotropic viscous material that builds up strength as you first generate and then eventually it holds the deposited material all throughout the end of the printing process. Uh, it is a continuous flow. Mixing is very important, especially for two-part systems or curing systems. As you can see here, one of the challenges for viscous solution printing is resolution. So the question is, what is the maximum or rather the smallest resolution can that can be uh, used for viscous solution printing. Uh, one can surmise that it can go uh, towards uh, sub-millimeter uh, uh, resolution. And it's only as good as the type of syringe or the opening of the syringe that is applied and the control of pressure. So looking closely at a um, typical ink composition, which of course uh, uh, goes from um, Newtonian to non-Newtonian, whether it's an emulsion, polymer solution, a hydrogel, rheology has to be optimized. In other words, you need to understand the rheology of your material uh, even before you do your first experiment. As you can see here, during deposition, you want the ink to be thixotropic, but at the same time, as you push this through the syringe, there is a sheer thinning effect that tends to reduce the ink viscosity at the printing tip so that the thicker ink in the syringe can be smoothly extruded to the thinner ink at the tip. In some cases, there is a dye swell. In other words, the material itself, itself can swell as it exits from the syringe. And then as you build the subsequent layers, there has to be sufficient storage modulus and shear yield stress. In other words, the strength has to build up to an elastic behavior uh, as the object is, is, is slowly uh, built uh, with various layers. Hence, ink solidification, ink rheology, ink composition has to be very well matched 
with different materials and the printing process. So here we will look at various types of materials that have been printed and uh, some of the resolution that has been achieved. One of my favorite materials is the use of graphene. And graphene can be formulated as a part of an ink, a suspension, or it can be modified such that you can control the uh, viscosity along with other ingredients such as uh, silica nanoparticles or uh, hydrogels. And as you can see here, uh, a graphene ink characteristics, uh, depending on the uh, use as a two-dimensional ink or three-dimensional ink, have very different requirements. A two-dimensional ink is something that will go into your inkjet printer or uh, even gravure printing. On the other hand, a 3D ink has to have a higher viscosity, a sufficient drying rate, a resolution that is controlled by the tip of the, the syringe or the nozzle, and uh, the wetting behavior uh, does not necessarily mean that you need to have a substantially wet or, or, or wetting behavior on the substrate. In other words, uh, a, a graphene ink used for inkjet printing is very different from a graphene ink for dispersion used for 3D printing, as you can see here. Now, another favorite material for 3D printing are hydrogels. Uh, hydrogels can be built uh, essentially by uh, building it, uh, let's say, from a solution. Uh, here you can see the hydrogel being deposited in a calcium chloride containing culture medium. As you deposit the alginate hydrogel, a type of cross-linking is observed or calcination is observed such that the hydrogel is built inside the solution of your uh, uh, medium. And as the uh, hydrogel uh, is uh, built up and then recovered from the uh, culture medium, you end up with this object. Uh, you can clearly see here that hydrogels uh, can be done in this manner and in some occasions, uh, not requiring a matrix, but directly printed from uh, air. The important requirement is, again, that material has to build up strength early on to so in order to support the consequently deposited layers. Uh, thixotropic behavior, thixotropic behavior, that is our keyword. Uh, here you can see bioprinting. Again, a lot of it is based on hydrogel material. The hydrogel can be a host of many things, including biomarkers, um, different types of media, dyes, uh, uh, different uh, um, cues for molecular imprinting or tissue engineering. Uh, bioprinting is a hot topic simply because it allows one to translate directly the shape that is uh, 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 or obtained from imaging methods such as MRI or fluorescence imaging or other types of uh, uh, scalable uh, imaging methods used in the biomedical field directly into a uh, biomaterials such as uh, uh, as these hydrogels here. Uh, interestingly, uh, you may be interested, uh, you may be looking at uh, materials based on chocolate. Okay, so unfortunately, I think we have a uh, problem here with uh, this particular slide. But uh, 3D printing of food is as much uh, of high interest and relevant uh, in terms of their science, uh, their viscosity parameters, but of course, aesthetically and deliciously, they're desirable uh, in the food industry or the culinary uh, industry. Uh, ceramic 3D printing, as you can see here, requires the use of, uh, again, a thixotropic material. Uh, the material itself uh, is initially used uh, as a viscous paste but then the ceramic property is only observed upon uh, autoclaving or heating or even um, uh, direct um, uh, carbonization. Uh, um, here you can see different types of objects with resolutions that are obtained essentially from the tip of the syringe or delivery method. However, you can use a big 
uh, delivery syringe or material and end up with a constructed uh, uh, construction free or uh, or rather additively manufactured uh, uh, building as shown here and this of course is cement cement is one of the most favorable uh, 3d printing viscous space that can be used of course for the construction industry now let's look at some nanomaterials and their compositions used for uh, making things like ceramic or metal so let's say the base extrusion of a ceramic precursor starts with a ink composition made up of ceramic particles surfactants uh, the ceramic particles are stabilized at, as an emulsion an oil and water interface you could add other types of polymers like polyvinyl alcohol um, polyethylene glycol and essentially develop a ceramic emulsion uh, ink. Now again, the rheological behavior changes as you add higher and higher volume percents of, uh, um, let's say, the uh, aluminum oxide particles. And uh, here I, I will introduce a term G prime. There's another term, term called G double prime, which are terms that you can extract from oscillatory rheological measurements. And this gives us a good um, picture of uh, what can be involved in investigating the viscoelastic behavior of uh, these materials. So in this case, this particular uh, volume percent, 40 percent, provides at least enough G prime or, or, or bulk or elastic modulus such that uh, it is suitable for printing. Now, after this material has been printed, then one can incinerate, calcify, or remove uh, the uh, materials that uh, can be sintered. And then finally generating a porous structure uh, such as this. So this is a porous ceramic structure that has been 3D printed from the original emulsion. In another case, one can use space extrusion to print metals. So starting with metal powders, this can be iron oxide, nickel oxide, copper oxide. One can disperse this with mixtures of solvents, phthalates, um, polymers, and then again achieve a rheological behavior sufficient for 3D printing. So uh, the polymer, for example, serves as a binder. The solvents uh, allows the good dispersions of the metal powders, which eventually can be evaporated. Uh, in other words, the optimized ink has to be uh, investigated in terms of its viscoelastic properties. And then finally, a match with the printing design and the, uh, let's say, the uh, head as well as the movement of the uh, CNC. And then finally, after you 3D printed the precursor metal, then we can sinter or reduce the uh, particular metals and end up with metal structure, albeit a more porous sintered metal structure compared to your casted or investment casted materials. Uh, here, glass can be fabricated, essentially starting with silica nanoparticles that can be dispersed in a solvent. Again, working with the solvent particles, the dispersion, the addition perhaps of polymers, one can achieve the right rheology. And after 3D printing the material, again, you can have a curing process that can involve a salt gel or cross-thinking process resulting in a 3D printed glass. Here is an example of 3D printing a thermoset polymer. A good example of a thermoset polymer is a box. Uh, polyurethane uh, is another example. The epoxy resin can be a one part or two part material. Epoxy can contain rheological modifiers such as silicon carbide, carbon fiber, uh, silicon nanoparticles. And then after printing, the complete curing of the epoxy can be achieved by elevated, putting it in an oven at elevated, elevated temperature for several hours. Uh, here you can see the viscometric and the rheological measurements 
that was done on the Optimize Inc. And it was found that sufficient storage modulus and shear yield stress was achieved at about 14 volume percent of adding nano clay. So in other words, the epoxy chemistry matrix was made sufficient for 3D printing by the addition of this filler. Uh, and then finally, as you can see here, the 3D printed epoxy resulted in um, very nice honeycomb structures with different designs yielding different mechanical response, essentially a 3D printed thermoset material. Now, a thermoplastic material is different from a thermoset in that it is plastic, that you can use temperature to uh, mold it, remold it, reshape it, or it's vulnerable to uh, temperature effects. This particular thermoplastic was based on polylactic acid uh, Im imbued with uh, carbon nanotubes. Of course, the common thermoplastic materials that have been 3D printed by FDM or SLS or SLA includes uh, poly uh, PLA, ABS, um, uh, nylon, uh, polyacrylates. But in this case, the thermoplastic printing was achieved by using a paste. So a thermoplastic material was uh, prepared and then the evaporation of dichloromethane as a solvent uh, enabled the fabrication of these structures, uh, uh, let's say with these different lattice structures uh, where you can investigate the uh, porosity and uh, the relationship with the structural pattern. Uh, again, uh, going back to the hydrogel, we did a look earlier at the hydrogel. Uh, this one uh, in particular is based on polyethylene glycol diacrylate um, together with alginate and calcium ions, where they 3D printed the material. And uh, after 3D printing the material, the whole structure was solidified by UV curing. Uh, UV curing enabled the, the formation of interpenetrated networks, semi-interpenetrated networks uh, that holds a clay as well as calcium. So again, prior to UV curing, the hydrogel needs to achieve a uh, rheological behavior, a pixotropic rheological behavior that allowed uh, them to fabricate these uh, structures as well. The printed hydrogels, in fact, are stretchable, compressible uh, with this particular composition. Uh, aerogels can be prepared. Uh, so what you have essentially is a precursor material, uh, in this case, a graphene oxide suspension together with an organic soil chemistry. Um, rheologically, uh, it was uh, further improved by the addition of silica powders or nanoparticles. Again, the rheological behavior here showed sufficient G prime uh, to achieve a bulk modulus even after deposition. And then finally, the aerogel can be prepared by uh, the removal of uh, a material within this uh, uh, aerogel or as shown here by direct carbonization reducing the material essentially to carbon, uh, where the graphene oxide uh, played a very important role in the uh, production of a robust carbon structure. Uh, lithium batteries have been candidates for 3D printing, as you can see here. Uh, phase extrusion printing of a lithium ion battery uh, based on a, uh, a concentration of LFP, the LFP dispersed part particles uh, were added to a solvent, uh, again, to achieve the right uh, shear thinning rheology during printing. Um, and then finally, as the 3D printed structure is made, then its demonstration as an electrode microarray was verified by measurements of voltage and aerial capacitance. Okay. So with our remaining time, let me just focus then on some of our recent work. Uh, here in our group, we are very, very much interested in silicone 3D printing. And uh, we've uh, published a number of papers on 3D printing, including uses of uh, silicone materials for SLA. 
Uh, but in uh, about two or three months' time, we'll be coming out with some of our recent work on 3D printed silicone and silicone nanocomposites. So silicone nanocomposites are important for industry. Essentially, when you go to Home Depot and buy your silicone adhesive or sealant, it's a silicone composition. Uh, essentially, it's it's a cross-linking process between the silane precursor or uh, silane or silicone polymers, and uh, this can be achieved uh, by the use of uh, cross-linkers uh, and different types of formulations can involve uh, plasticizer, pigments, promoters. So what you end up buying at Home Depot is essentially a formulated silicone. Interestingly, these are some of the best 3D printing materials you can get because they are made to be pixotropic. And here you can see some of the things we wanted to pay. We paid attention before the 3D printing process itself. We wanted to simulate the relationship between viscosity, fluid, the internal radius of the nozzle, the printing speed, the height of the printed pattern, the tapered zone length and the required pressure to push the material out of the syringe, which can be uh, all summarized in this figure in this equation. Uh, viscosity was sufficient for these uh, uh, materials that we use. This actual three, two materials here are actually bought from Home Depot. Dow Corning SE 1700 uh, was bought uh, directly from Dow Corning. But as you can see here, all these, three all these three materials have the rheological uh, visco elastic properties that we want. We did not uh, do any uh, rheological or oscillating rheological measurements uh, with these materials at this point. So to simply uh, show to you what can be done, uh, these are silicones that we 3D printed with various tip sizes, as you can see here, from low to high resolution. Uh, we 3D printed clear and white uh, uh, silicone, formulated silicone sealant. You can see here the uh, uh, grid uh, that we prepared. Here's a picture of a high resolution printing that we achieved basically by matching the viscosity, the STL slicing file, uh, the uh, movement of the um, syringe as well as the, uh, again, the type of material that we use. And to demonstrate that these are elastomers, we made our own elastomeric um, tennis ball. And here you can see the two halves, we printed them separately, uh, and then we joined them together uh, to end up with our own elastomeric silicone ball. So I, at this point, I'm ready to conclude, and I would like to leave enough time for questions. So in summary, I've shown to you that 3D printing is one, but one of a family of 3D printing methods, very specific for extruded uh, uh, and printed viscous liquids or inks. With the right rheology, with the right viscoelastic properties, one can match them with a CNC movement that's your viscous solution printing. Uh, here, uh, the two main statements I like to make is that there, it has to have the right sheening, shear thinning property necessary for continuous and stable extrusion through the syringe tip. On the other hand, it needs to have sufficient storage modulus and shear yield stress such that it retains the shape. And then the key, uh, Viscoelastic behavior here is thixotropic. Rheological modification can be achieved by adding shear thinning fillers, including clay, uh, fume silica, ceramic particles, etc. On the other hand, one can build the strength uh, and the flow behavior either by changing the solvent parameters, the evaporation rate, the cross linking chemistry and of course concentration. Uh, some of the materials that we've extruded or included for extrusion uh, involves the use of graphene, epoxy, polyethylene uh, glycol acrylate, uh, which can be used for post curing. And of course, this can be labeled as hydrogel, pre-ceramic, pre-metal, um, 
uh, thermoplastic polymer solutions and so on. Uh, and then finally, a, a material that has been 3D printed can be finished or cured by UV curing, thermal curing, freeze drying, sintering, and I forgot to mention here the use of coatings. So with that, I'm ready to come uh, to do our end talk, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much for the detailed talk there, Professor Advincula. Um, as the professor mentioned, we are now going to enter uh, the question and answer portion of today's webinar session. And it looks like we do have, uh, we do have one question here. So um, let's go ahead and start up with the questions. We'll do announcements later. Uh, the first question, <clears throat> let's see here, it reads, do you have a good example for using 3D printing to fabricate a working electronic device? Um, thank you for that question. The uh, paper that we're uh, finishing right now involves the fabrication of a plastic motor, a plastic electric motor. So uh, what we did is we utilized um, uh, graphene oxide emulsions together with uh, SLS or uh, laser sintering method to um, 3D print powders uh, that have been impregnated with this uh, conductive material. And then we ended up demonstrating a DC motor that can be uh, fabricated from plastic. So instead of metal, we have plastic. Now, as far as electronics is concerned, one can look, of course, at uh, uh, use of 3D printing to produce uh, batteries, uh, electrodes, such as the uh, one I've shown on the lithium ion uh, polymer uh, electrode. Uh, but then one can go towards fabricating different sh sh shapes of PCB boards or incorporating it in the layout of various circuit patterns, uh, both 2D and 3D where uh, the circuit pattern can be made up of a conductive ink. It could be silver ink, it could be carbon nanotube or graphene-based ink uh, that can be uh, reduced or further converted to a more conducting or semiconducting form by post curing methods. So uh, in our group, uh, we're very interested in such uh, direction, but there are other groups who have taken the lead in uh, printed electronics as well. Thank you, Professor. Our next question reads, can you discuss the challenges with getting started with extrusion printing? So with extrusion printing, uh, of course, one can go to um, commercial systems right away. You need to uh, get essentially a uh, 3D printing as simple as a uh, uh, an FDM 3D printer, and then the manufacturer can have an option or can partner with a company that replaces the FDM head with a uh, head that is suitable for viscous solution printing. Now, a do-it-yourself method is possible. Uh, what you need to do there is to come up with a um, mechanically a driven syringe that pushes the material and replacing essentially the head with a syringe. So this is as simple as you can get with um, viscous solution printing. Uh, of course, uh, one can ser search the market for more uh, exotic type of syringes where the motor is, is fixed with the head rather than push uh, from a uh, um, uh, automated syringe apparatus and a reservoir tank of your business space. Uh, uh, lately, I've been uh, observing uh, some companies or, or, or we're working with companies who actually uh, develop uh, uh, small syringes with fixed motors that can be controlled and programmed so that you can have control on the flow rate directly on the head as well as a heating option. And so this type of uh, Viscous solution printing methods is gaining traction, but more or less uh, the principle is, is there. 
the main thing is to be able to control the relationship within the business material, the design slash CAD design slicing software, and of course the capabilities of the instrument itself. Thank you. Our next question reads, that was a great talk. Could you please explain how 3D printing can be explored in the field of automobile manufacturing? So thank you for that encouraging remark. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, for automotive printing, uh, uh, two years ago, actually, I was invited in a light weighting uh, conference where they asked me to talk about 3D printing and light weighting. Great correlation. Um, very good that you know the question was asked uh, with regards to the automotive industry. Still a very big industry. Still relies on a lot on traditional manufacturing. But in principle, the uh, uh, uses of metal, high-performance polymers, even thermoplastics uh, for parts replacement uh, is there. And uh, right now, 3D printing is actually used in the automotive industry mainly for rapid prototyping. Uh, there's a case that can be made for applying 3D printing to produce molds and tools. Molds and tools are very important for the injection molding industry uh, of plastic or fabrication of plastic parts. Usually the molds itself is made of aluminum or other metals that has to be milled and takes you know, weeks to months in order to design and prepare. On the other hand, 3D printing can produce that mold or tool or part within hours or days. Uh, thus, you have an immediate savings for the tooling industry uh, for uh, automotive parts. Then we go to light weighting. Light weighting means that things that can be replaced uh, like metal, metal structures, metal parts can be replaced with plastic, high performance plastic, uh, carbon fiber composites. So yes, uh, let's say the application of polymers like polyether, either ketone or EPS or high performance nylon uh, perhaps can replace parts that are used under the hood. And uh, this type of materials uh, are actually of high interest to us. And we have been 3D printing peak for a year now and are now looking at uh, uh, the use of nanocomposites to improve further the thermal, thermal mechanical properties of, of polyether ether ketone. Okay, very good. Um, before we get to the last question here in queue, I noticed that uh, some folks have their hands raised using the hand raise function uh, here on their control panel. If uh, if you did that by accident, that's fine. Uh, if you did that with the intent to ask a question, um, no need to use the hand raising function and go to webinar. You can go ahead and just type them in, uh, and the software will uh, will order them sequentially. So if you have a question, just feel free to type it in at will. Um, okay. So the last question that we have here in queue, it reads, <clears throat> how small scale or how small scale can 3D printing go? Uh, for example, have you seen any nanoscale features uh, being printed? Again, very good question. Uh, I will, uh, I will um, not talk about this solution printing yet uh, to the nanoscale. Although, in principle, you can go all the way there if you have a nano needle. But uh, the best resolution so far with uh, 3D printing can be achieved by uh, uh, photochemical means or uh, what we call specifically two photon uh, uh, polymerization 3D printing. And the closest you can see that uh, is a device that is based on SLA, okay? or a stereolithographic apparatus, which involves a one photon process. And that means it can be activated or initiated by UV light or long wave U, uh, UV, and the chemistry involves polymerization of acrylate um, uh, monomers, dimers, or, or derivatives. Uh, that particular resolution can go all the way to a micron level. Uh, Typically, the resolution can involve micron to 100 micron level. But to go down the one micron level, I actually 
uh, have seen a machine. I forgot the name of the company, but uh, those type of 3D printers can actually be uh, accessible inside the clean room. Okay, so it is possible to achieve resolutions below one micron with 3D printing and the application of a two photon polymerization process. All right, thank you very much. Um, Kartik, if you can hear me, I got your message. Um, let me follow up with you um, uh, via email on that question. That's, uh, that, one's a, that one's a unique one. <laughs> and uh, I can answer that uh, on the side. Um, okay, so with that, I am uh, looking at 9.54 here Pacific. So that means we only have a couple minutes in our hour. Uh, so if you guys have any last minute questions, go ahead and quickly type them in. Um, and I'll go over some uh, announcements here in the in the time that we have left. Uh, first off, if you have any questions after the session, um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, you can email uh, Professor Advincula directly. Uh, Professor, I believe your email address is rca41 at case.edu. Uh, if you could put up your title slide, that'd be great. Um, you can reach Park Systems for any questions regarding nanoscale microscopy techniques, such as atomic force microscopy um, and uh, other scanning probe techniques at parkafm.com. Let me go ahead and send that to the audience here, parkafm.com. Uh, if you wanted to forward the professor's talk to a colleague, or uh, maybe an understudy. Um, we have all of our uh, webinars recorded and they will eventually be posted to our YouTube channel. That's right, Park Systems is on YouTube and that is the second URL I've sent out to chat. Uh, feel free to uh, subscribe there and take a look at our back catalog. Professor Advincula and our other speakers have been especially prolific with giving us um, some of their time and also lending us their expertise to craft a couple of webinars uh, for several years now. So please check out our previous series. They're all on there online. Um, and then really quickly, uh, some uh, let's turn an eye to the future. We do have a couple of webinars on the horizon as early as next week. Uh, later next week, we will be giving uh, uh, two webinars on electrochemical atomic force microscopy, ECAFM. Uh, those uh, session signups are on parkafm.com. One will be specifically for the East Asian audience, so that might be a little bit of a challenge for us here in the Western Hemisphere, time zone wise. But we will have another one in the Western Hemisphere at, uh, I believe, 2 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Central. Um, that one, however, is going to be broadcast in Spanish. Uh, if you are interested, though, in seeing the English version of that uh, webinar, I did perform uh, the electrochemical atomic force microscopy talk uh, back in January. So that's in English on our Park Systems YouTube channel. So feel free to check that out. And then the last uh, webinar on the horizon, or actually two webinars on the horizon, we're going to be continuing the 3D printing series uh, with Professor Advincula next month. And uh, I believe our topic then is going to be, actually, I'm going to have to uh, announce that. That one uh, will be announced for the middle of March. Uh, so please keep an eye out on your email and on parkafm.com for the exact uh, topic that we're going to be doing. But it's a continuation of this 3D printing series here. So if you enjoyed this one or found it useful, please come in again next month uh, and we will be continuing the series. Uh, the last one that we'll be doing next month is the start of a new series, and that's going to be focused on amyloid protein analysis using AFM. Uh, that is going to be delivered by Dr. Francesco Simone Ruggeri from the University of Cambridge. Details for that one and the signups are now live on parkafm.com. So if you're interested in using AFM for more biological applications, single molecule analysis, of amyloid proteins, you know, precursors for uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Definitely take a look there. Signups again are live at parkafm.com. Okay, we have 
one more question. This will be the last question for today since we're um, coming up at the top of the hour. Uh, the last question, Professor, reads, House, oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's go ahead and select the last question. Here we go. In case of phone manufacturing, if there are 3D printed parts, um, is there a possibility that you see of their efficiency increasing? Phone manufacturing. Um, well, uh, we can look at various aspects. Uh, you know, with this short time, I can just divide it between the um, electronics part, or it could be uh, the housing part, or the more aesthetically visible part. A lot of those things can be classified as metallic or non-metallic, and of course, uh, resolution is important. So, what I can just focus uh, with, you know, what one minute time we have is that. A lot of things that can be injection molded certainly is within the realm of 3D printing uh, in terms of uh, what our cap uh, current capabilities are. The question really is on prototyping uh, or versus production. And I believe the production phase is coming with 3D printing. It's just that it's a challenge now on what type of materials can qualify for that production. And that is really the, the game that we're pursuing. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you again, Professor, for your time and for lending us your expertise in this field. Uh, that'll wrap it up for today's session. We are just about out of time. Uh, thank you again. I got all the announcements that I wanted to out a couple of minutes ago. Um, Professor, any closing thoughts before we close today's session? So again, I'd like to thank Park AFM, but more importantly, I'd like to thank our audience for uh, 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 starting this series with, with us. Uh, I look forward to um, your participation. And again, like Gerald mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, feel, free, feel free to email me at rca41 at case.edu. All right. Thanks, everybody. And if you had a private request sent to me via chat, I will take care of that today. We will see you again in the future for another webinar from Park Systems. And until then, take care, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.